and other work that the partners have been doing. So yeah, hopefully you're here because you're a, a public landowner um, or involved in, oh, thank you, Anne-Marie. I forgot to say, yes, please start recording. Um, yeah, so we're gonna hear a, a bunch of different good practice examples from, from different public uh, landowners. And then we're gonna have a bit of time for questions um, and a bit, then a bit more detail on some of the things we've been working on in the project around with uh, working with local authorities and also an introduction to the community land advisory service. And then there'll be a bit more time for kind of questions and discussion as needed as well. Um, but yeah, just to kind of frame today's event before we get into it, um, you know, we're, we're all very conscious as the Resilient Green Spaces team of the many pressures that are facing public landowners, um, you know, different demands on land from housing to infrastructure to uh, adapting to climate change and supporting biodiversity, providing sustainable food, the list goes on. So um, we understand it's, it's, there's many pressures on public land and we're hoping that um, through the examples and the kind of discussion that we're going to have today that you'll see some ways that different public landowners have worked in kind of more creative ways to, to use land in a multifunctional way and also to to make things work th within the sort of context of budget cuts and being short staffed and and things that local authorities and other public landowners are having to deal with so yeah that's kind of the the spirit that we're coming into today with and i hope it'll be really useful for you um and i was just going to say that we're yeah like i said we have bits for questions so we're the first bit we're just going to play a few little videos and then we're going to get a, a presentation as well from nrw so if you kind of ho either hold your questions until after that or um just pop them in the chat if you can't remember them and we'll get to them in the q a section in a little bit um but i think that's probably all i need to say for now so i'm going to pass over to nick to get on with our first um Thanks very much, everyone. Um, so I am Nick Perkins. I'm one of the Joint Wales Managers at Social Farms and Gardens, and I'm currently focusing on the allotments work stream within the Resilient Green Spaces programme. Um, I wanted to share with you a case study today around um, some allotments in Blyna Gwent. Um, Social Farms and Gardens has been working very closely with Welsh Government to support them in the delivery of their um, allotment support grants. So this has been going out to each local authority area over the last couple of years and we've just had confirmation of funding for the next two years. Um, the size of the funding is based on the number of allotments in that local authority area and the number of people that live in the region as well and it's designed to be able to help um, local authorities to invest in the their allotment infrastructure so um, paths, security, water, etc, but also increase the number of plots. And that's really something that we've been looking to do with through resilient green spaces, working with private and public sector landowners to put more land into community ownership. So whilst those grants are focused on local authority areas, actually, there's no reason why that money can't potentially benefit communities um, or sites that could be run by communities. And that for local authorities um, and public sector landowners gives them the opportunity to potentially increase their capacity through communities delivering what communities want. So just to share my case study now, uh, this is some good practice that we've come across in Blyna Gwent. Can't hear it. Sorry, bear with me all. Why is it important to Blyna Gwent Council to see more communities making better use of your green spaces? Um, we have uh, a number of areas in Blyna Gwent um, that we um, successfully managed and engaged with communities to look after green spaces. Um, it varies from the larger local nature reserves, it could be allotments, it could be a community garden and they're throughout the county. Um, and we like to seek to add value to our green spaces and we find that connecting with people with the landscape, nature, sustainable lifestyles, it all adds value. Um, it's 
also a chance to support um, physical and um, mental health well-being. Um, it's also an opportunity for us to work as a team across the project. So we might be able to give additional support through biodiversity ecological advice. There might be trees on site so we can provide expert um, tree advice on TPOs and things like that. Um, but also it's just a way of generally sharing information, engaging with the landscape, with the environment, with citizen science. There's opportunities there for recording species um, and for projects like allotments, we can introduce ecological improvements to the site or we can encourage connectivity between allotments and community green spaces. Um, so we just find that sharing with the community and acknowledging their knowledge as well just adds to the overall um, project and what we can provide as a council as well. <laughs> if you could explain yeah why you as a community council are keen to make land available to communities and what you see the benefits of that are. OK, we're always keen to, um, to promote the use of land um, amongst our communities and to get community involvement um, into various projects. They're the obvious benefits of actually being outside and actually um, growing things for yourself uh, and also then being part of a, a wider community that that generally help each other in these um, different sites. Um, and again, that's for us to to promote well-being um, in any way, shape, or form that we can um, actually find it. And I think um, providing allotments is one of those avenues. Not the only one, but it is one of those avenues. Yeah, and it is great what you said around the um, the town and bloom sort of concepts, giving planters to dip groups, because obviously if they can start on a smaller scale, it helps uh, sort of ensure success if they do want to upscale in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I also need to bear in mind, an, an allotment could just be two or three plots. It doesn't need to be a couple of acres. It doesn't need to be um, some huge undertaking. Um, a bit of land can be as small or as large as we actually feel there's the need to fulfil to um, that land. OK, we were approached by the then Treasurer back in uh, January 2022, which is just over a year ago. Um, after we'd sent out our letter to say um, this is the, your invoice for this year's rent, and she basically turned up and said she was the only one left on the allotment site and she was going to give it up. So there would no longer be an allotment association out there. But we'd also been aware of a couple of people who actually wanted to take that over. And then we would then work to constitute a new allotment a, a committee and association up there, which we then did. I mean, I facilitated the the meetings. Um, they took on uh, a constitution, um, so all all formally um, notified and recorded. Um, so they then ended up where we've got a formal committee working the allotments at Gatley Um we had over a number of years been paying Blind of Gwent County Borough Council £10 a year um, for that allotment site, but the lease for that had run out a number of years ago and nobody had actually figured out that um, a new lease needed to be, be in place. So that was my first task and that's why the other four allotment sites have not done anything with because I've been involved in trying to figure this one out first <laughs> to, to get the legality. So I'm in negotiations now with Blind Gwent County Borough Council um, to get that uh, out. That would be the Community Council's lease from Blind Gwent County Borough Council. We will then end up subleasing it back to the Allotment Association. Yeah. Um, now to be fair, the, the, the there's about half a dozen members on the allotment association they've done an awful lot of clearing work up there because it was in a complete state um, and we've provided them um, a bit of logistic support um, we've spoken to people like Welsh Water to try and get um, direct water access to the site I, but we initially, um, when we retired and closed our business down, we, we, we grew a lot of food in our gardens. So on the back of that, we were looking for allotment plots. So we looked around Abbott Lady for plots to actually um, grow some food. It came to fruition that, that there were none available. 
but uh, we walked past this site on numerous occasions. We, we seen that it become overgrown. So we did some investigation and I found out that it was actually leased by the town council. So we, we arranged then to have a meeting with them and actually take the site on. Initially, we were just going to clear um, a small amount of ground up the top, just to allow us to grow and then bring people on as the, uh, the site um, grew larger. But um, we've had a really good response at the moment. We've got 11 people working on it with a, uh, a quite a backlog of people who, who actually want plots. So uh, it's become um, a necessity to start to clear the ground on the bottom section, which we're on now, um, to actually um, get more people to grow. Lovely. Thanks, Nick, for sorting us out. Great insight. And um, we're going to move on to our second uh, video now, which is in French, so don't despair, but there's subtitles. Avec ses cantines 100% bio, sa régie municipale agricole et ses actions d'éducation, la ville de Moinsartou a mis en place depuis de nombreuses années déjà une politique alimentaire durable qui vise à préserver la santé de ses citoyens et de son environnement. La ville est aujourd'hui reconnue comme un modèle à l'échelle nationale et internationale et ne compte pas s'arrêter en si bon chemin. Depuis 2012, les cantines de la ville sont passées au 100% bio avec une majorité de produits issus de l'agriculture locale, de la région PACA et du Piémont italien. Ce passage au 100% bio s'est fait sans surcoût et ce grâce à la diminution drastique du gaspillage qui est passé de 150 à 30 grammes par assiette, soit une diminution de 80%. Au cœur de cette transformation, les équipes de cuisine qui œuvrent quotidiennement pour fournir des repas aux trois écoles primaires de la ville. Dans les cuisines de Montsartou, nous n'utilisons que des produits bruts. Les légumes arrivent directement de notre régie agricole et sont pesés. Nous nous chargeons ensuite de les décontaminer. Le travail prend du temps, c'est difficile, mais c'est beaucoup plus intéressant pour nous d'utiliser des produits frais, non préparés. Et nous savons ce que nos enfants mangent. Alors aujourd'hui, nous avons au menu une salade composée avec des tomates, des concombres, du basilic, de la cébette, de l'oignon rouge. En plat chaud, nous avons un gratin de pâtes aux légumes avec omelette et nous avons du yaourt avec confiture de fraises et abricots. Alors le lundi, nous avons l'atelier d'étape pour les enfants. Donc j'ai un groupe de 13 enfants et nous faisons des ateliers, des salades de fruits, de la tapenade, de l'anchoyade, euh, des smoothies. Ça plaît beaucoup aux enfants de pouvoir travailler les recettes, les légumes, les fruits. Située dans une région de faible production agricole, la ville a dû innover afin de pouvoir fournir des produits bio et locaux aux cantines. C'est pour cela qu'elle a créé la première régie agricole municipale de France afin de produire elle-même ses légumes. Depuis 2011, trois agriculteurs cultivent 3,5 hectares de terre et fournissent 25 tonnes de légumes par an aux cantines, ce qui représente 85% de leur approvisionnement. Rien de tout cela n'aurait été possible sans l'implication des élus qui soutiennent et mettent en place de nombreux projets. Depuis plusieurs années, la ville de Montsartou développe un projet alimentaire de, de territoire pour euh, construire notre souveraineté alimentaire et offrir à nos habitants une alimentation respectueuse de, de la santé et, et de l'environnement. Au début, nous sommes bien sûr appuyés sur le levier de la restauration collective, qui est la, la compétence de base des, des communes, pour offrir aux enfants une alimentation saine, mais aussi pour sensibiliser les parents à, à ces enjeux. Et ensuite, à travers la Maison d'éducation et l'alimentation durable, nous avons développé de nombreuses animations, événements pour sensibiliser et éduquer l'ensemble des habitants de la commune à acheter plus local, plus bio, plus de saison. Et pour permettre la réussite de ce projet, bien sûr, il a fallu travailler sur l'offre alimentaire et donc développer et préserver les surfaces agricoles et aider les agriculteurs bio à s'installer sur le, sur le territoire pour permettre un approvisionnement direct de la population auprès des agriculteurs locaux. Persuadé que l'éducation est la clé d'un changement d'habitude et de comportement, l'équipe municipale a mis en place de nombreuses actions destinées aux enfants scolarisés dans les écoles de la ville. Elle s'est pour cela appuyée sur les équipes d'animation qui éduquent les enfants tous les jours. Avec toute l'équipe d'animation, nous mettons en place des activités pour les enfants. Nous les éduquons à adopter les bons réflexes pour une alimentation durable et un environnement sain. Nous les amenons sur cette parcelle pédagogique qui est spécialement destinée aux enfants et juste à côté de celle qui produit les légumes pour les cantines. 
ici, ils peuvent ainsi vivre les saisons, les toucher, les sentir et pratiquer des notions de jardinage écologique, bien évidemment, sans pesticides. Il y a également des classes d'immersion qui viennent toute une semaine et pratiquent leurs cours en parallèle d'activités autour de l'alimentation durable et de, de l'environnement. Et sur les temps d'activité périscolaire également, ils viennent régulièrement. Si les actions d'éducation visent principalement les enfants, la ville cherche aussi à plus largement éduquer ses citoyens. C'est pour cela qu'elle a mis en place ce défi famille alimentation positive qui chaque année permet à une vingtaine de familles d'apprendre à manger plus de produits bio, plus de produits locaux et ce sans augmenter leur budget. Différents ateliers tels que des ateliers cuisine ou nutrition ainsi que des visites de producteurs ou de commerçants locaux sont organisés. Les résultats sont très positifs puisque cette année les familles ont déclaré avoir consommé 26% de produits bio en plus tout en réduisant de 26 centimes le prix de revient de leur repas. La ville cherche aussi à régulièrement évaluer ses actions et a mis pour cela en place un questionnaire qui est posé tous les trois ans aux familles. Cette année, les résultats ont été aussi très positifs puisque les familles ont déclaré pour 97% d'entre elles être satisfaites des actions menées par la ville en termes de restauration collective scolaire et 87% d'entre elles ont même déclaré avoir changé leurs habitudes alimentaires grâce aux actions menées par la ville. Pour piloter le projet alimentaire de la ville, la mairie a décidé en octobre 2016 de créer un service dédié à l'alimentation durable. Il s'agit de la Maison d'éducation à l'alimentation durable ou MEAD. C'est une équipe de six personnes qui met en œuvre et coordonne les différentes actions du projet alimentaire territorial. Donc ça passe par l'installation d'agriculteurs sur la commune, euh, la structuration de la filière économique, euh, l'essaimage de la pratique de Montsartou ou encore la sensibilisation des publics scolaires ou des citoyens. Nous cherchons également à toucher des publics qui sont de prime abord plus éloignés ou moins concernés par l'alimentation durable, comme les personnes âgées, ou les entreprises au travers de groupes de travail avec le secteur privé. Et enfin, nous essayons de travailler des thématiques plus nouvelles autour de l'alimentation durable, comme l'implication citoyenne ou l'évaluation d'impact sur une santé globale des actions autour de l'alimentation. Afin de faire toujours avancer son projet alimentaire, la ville de mont sartou a noué de nombreux partenariats extérieurs. C'est notamment le cas avec l'Université de Côte d'Azur, avec qui elle a mis en place un diplôme universitaire de chef de projet en restauration collective durable qui permet chaque année à une douzaine d'étudiants de se former aux techniques de mont pour ensuite les importer dans leur propre collectivité. La ville a aussi été en 2018 désignée chef de file du projet européen Biocantines qui, financé par l'Union européenne, permet à six autres villes en Europe de transférer la pratique de mont et de l'adapter à leur propre situation. Grâce à un engagement combiné de ses élus, de ses techniciens et de ses citoyens, la ville de mont s'est imposée comme une ville pionnière de l'alimentation durable et cherche à partager ses idées à différentes collectivités en France et en Europe afin de faire avancer la transition écologique. That's one of the sessions, that, uh, the projects that Kim's been working with um, in Europe. So um, if you have, do you have any questions, uh, then be able to help answer them. And our final one is a bit closer to home. So just down in Swansea uh, at Morriston Hospital. So a partnership between the health board um, in the city and a local grower. Community supported agriculture is a partnership between farmers and consumers in which the responsibilities, risks and rewards of farming are shared. Members pay monthly subscriptions and in return they get organically locally grown produce. So how did the Health Board get a CSA? Well, a Natural Resources Wales study identified a need for locally grown food in the Swansea East area. The Health Board had land that was unsuitable for healthcare development but ideal for growing. So Swansea Bay University Health Board then approached me as I was looking for available land. In November 2021, the project led by Amanda Davis was approved with a 10-year lease given at a peppercorn rate. We have now been on site from May 22 with the first harvest expected in May 23. The food produced will feed around 150 households per week and this project supports the Health Board's wider work on both the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and wider sustainability issues. There we go. Right, I'm going to pass over to um, 
uh, Cara now, who's going to share with us uh, a live presentation after all that video. So hopefully that will uh, go nicely. Cara, can I pass over to you? Uh, to my pal, but I do have a fair med I get the complete assault and go hot the Adi Sharad heavy. Thank you for having me. Um, I I gather this is a wider audience than Wales, so just a little quick note. Um, oh, I haven't shared my screen, have I? I'll just share my screen quickly. One second. Can you all see that all right? Can you see my screen now? Yeah, that's great. OK, great. Um, <clears throat> just a note to say that uh, so Natural Resources Wales, NRW, uh, we are the um, we were created in 2013. It's the merger of the Environment Agency in Wales, the Forestry Commission and um, the Countryside Council. Um, in case not everyone's sure about that, we're divided into six six uh, land regions and one coastal. And I work in the southwest uh, for the People and Places team. Um, so just to say uh, briefly, I'll try and tell you about one of the engagement um, projects we that I'm involved with at the moment, which is on <clears throat> on my patch in Carmarthenshire. Um, we are trying to work a bit differently. Uh, from from our historical work with a local community to try out new ways of working together. We're looking at co-designing uh, new land management practices on a new piece of farmland which was purchased um, by NRW uh, a couple of years ago. It's not uh, without controversy and challenge, and we you know we are learning on this, so um, it's a work in progress. Right. Hopefully that's changed slide. So just a bit of context briefly. Uh, of course, as happened elsewhere, the um, Welsh Government declared a climate emergency in 2019. And that is driving a lot, a lot of our work as well as the nature emergency. Um, there's aspirations to create 43,000 hectares of wood, new woodland, new woodland by 2030. Uh, to help meet carbon reduction targets. And most of this uh, is achieved uh, via NRW on land owned by others. So we don't have to own it ourselves, thankfully. Um, but we do have, we're also responsible for the Welsh Government Woodland Estate. So we do own woodland. Um, and NRW has a remit to plant trees uh, on, yeah, we have to plant trees on our land to maintain the levels of woodland cover. Um, so we don't, because we're losing a bit of woodland every year to, for example, development of renewable energy projects. So we have to keep up the uh, levels of woodland. Um, the other context we have is uh, the cultural context. It's, you know, this buying land is sensitive. It can be controversial. It's very high profile in the media. Um, and communities are worried about land purchase uh, for carbon offsetting by large uh, urban companies, generally from outside of Wales, which uh, you know understandably worries people are frightened, are frightened of being priced out of agriculture and uh, the cultural language uh, impacts on fragile rural uh, communities and economy. So that is a that is the kind of context of what we're dealing with, uh, and we have to be sensitive to those things. We uh, NRW acquired the site in February last year, and it was under the fund for creating new woodland. Um, but it's not as straightforward as that. It's 94 hectare site with uh, historic and ecological features. Uh, it's in a rural area of dispersed farming communities with uh, two villages nearby, but they're quite separated from the land by a fast A road and a railway. And there is no, no, not really public access. Um, so NRW recognised that not all of this land could be, could be planted up for woodland. Uh, it falls naturally into about five different um, areas. So the commemorative woodland can be uh, 
that we're going to be planting commemorative woodland in the sort of south area here on part of the site. Uh, we're going to develop and encourage public access to that area, but not all of the site will have public access. You can see down here the river has been canalised in the past, so there will be work to sort of straighten it, uh, not straighten it, to unstraighten it and let it go back into its natural, you can see the natural meanders and channels that it, that it used to follow. Um, so there'll be re river restoration. There's a hay meadow, uh, there's lovely hay meadows up in the sort of north area of the site, section seven habitat, um, which will be managed appropriately. And most interesting to me and, and to this conversation today is the, uh, there's about 40 hectares of good quality agricultural growing land up in the north of the area of the site. It's mainly two or three big fields here which have had all the hedges removed in the past on many of the historic boundaries uh, and there's a couple of um, uh, so that's uh, improved grassland and then we've got less improved grassland here. So in, in terms of the public consultation um, the, the national, the land management team is, is a national team at NRW who do the purchasing and, and arrange all the, the big schemes. They, seeing this purchase and some others they're doing as a, as a chance to try different ways of engaging with the communities around that land um, and to break, break the cycle of people feeling they're just being informed and not, not not truly consulted. So um, they've brought in, in each case, they're bringing in the sort of people and places team local to that land. And inside NRW, we also have a, a sort of engagement practitioners network where we can support each other it's voluntary to join and we help each other out with, um, you know, advice and, and experience. So a lot of the slides I'm going to show you now are on a consultation document which was shared with the public after after the two consultations. So I'll try and share that in the chat afterwards if I can. Um, in March 2022, we held the first um, consultation, which was a shared um, a shared online survey on citizen space. Uh, we ran a, a drop in at one in village hall at one of the nearby villages and uh, directly contacted neighbours to the site and key local stakeholders. So there was a lot of response to that. I think 120 odd responses were catalogued. Um, most uh, responses were around biodiversity as the most important thing to consider uh, around the creation of new woodland. <clears throat> and uh, several responses, We it was interesting to know they were concerned about the introduction of public access and um, the effects on wildlife or, or livestock of people and, and dogs. Um, another interesting point was there were suggestions by some people of planting an orchard. So that was actually carried out uh, in this uh, southern area last uh, in the planting season over last winter. Uh, and several issues were raised, uh, several concerns and Bear in mind, this is March 2022, so that was the Ukrainian war was starting. There was a lot of concern in the media about food shortages. And the big concern that we had long conversations with people about was about losing agricultural land uh, to woodland, um, which is understandable. Um, <clears throat> so we are focused the, um, I'll just move on to the next slide. So as a result of the feedback, we divided the site into three areas, uh, each of which will be approached slightly differently. Uh, so just for the purpose of today, we'll focus on the on the growing space, this orange patch in the north. Uh, this is an area that was was of most concern to local people, as I said, and we want to try and work differently to make sure you know, we have the best outcomes for this land and for the community. So we ran a second public consultation in July, four months later, uh, responding to that initial feedback. We focused um, on the protective fields uh, to address their concern. And this uh, 
as this is still a woodland creation scheme, we presented several options to them for increasing tree cover up to about 20% uh, alongside the agricultural production. So we asked consultees to, to look at the various benefits these options might deliver, uh, as well as uh, delivering, delivering us food and what they would most like to see established on the site. We had survey responses again online and we went via email and letter and also in person at, at the second uh, village hall. <coughs> so, so far, from the from the feedback we've had, we we've widened existing hedgerows, and we've re-established the historic field boundaries. Um, they've been fenced as well to allow continued grazing. So we're doing a short term uh, short term lease at the moment with a, a local local grazier to keep the to keep the land um, being used for food and to keep it uh, managed. We've we've also established groups of infilled trees. So in this area here, it was there's some large trees. It's sort of more of a parkland pasture area. Uh, those the existing trees have been fenced fenced off, and and a new scattering of trees has been planted there too to continue that parkland style. I think uh, you know it's interesting just to point out that the Welsh government is asking landowners to commit to 10% uh, tree cover on agricultural land. So I think it's really important that NRW also goes through this experience with agricultural land to see what the pitfalls and the challenges are <clears throat> and to see you know how much food they can also continue to to get from that land whilst increasing tree cover. So we'll go through that process with with uh, food growers. So the productive land will be managed with a set of prescriptions. Um, with the priority of climate and nature recovery objectives as well as food production. After the replanting and infrastructure is complete, uh, which will be sort of like, you know, over the, uh, the planting season last winter and next winter, and we're putting in fencing and a pass and, and sort of parking area uh, this summer. After that, we we well, from this summer onwards, we're really we the next step is to consult with the agricultural sector, with young farmers, horticulturalists, land advisors, etc. And um, we're hoping in the autumn winter to be preparing a land management agreement or expression of interest with one or several parties. But we do want to do that in a collaborative way, and you know we'll we'll be putting out draft and and getting response from people. And we're, we're quite aware of the sort of pitfalls of working with NRW. It's a, a massive organisation with, of course, uh, can be restrictive, but we're hoping that that is um, providing a good opportunity as well. And we'll do our best to, to try and minimise the barriers. <laughs> so oh, it's just a correction on the last slide. I think May 2023 uh, on the, the final date, I think that should be 2024. Very much hope so. <clears throat> Um, but this is our rough timeline for the next steps for the site. So with the aim of more, more planting and co-designing, as I said, uh, agreed over this winter, ready for the long-term partnership agreement next, next spring, next summer, if we're lucky. Uh, so just in conclusion, I, I think uh, it's fair to say, like society, we, we in NRW are in the middle of a sea change um, with the nature and climate emergency driving us. We're, we're trialing, <clears throat> doing our best to try new ways of working and new projects such as the, the Skyline project in South Wales. And we have new teams uh, like the one I'm in. The People and Places team has only been around for, for three years. So it started just before COVID. And so this isn't a slick process. It might be painful and there will probably be too little funding and probably too much bureaucracy. Um, but we're doing our best with the situation. And we, it was still very much at the start of this journey. We don't know where we'll end up or what will what will count as successful or what lessons will be learned, but but we are keen to try and, and test different ways of partnership working and engagement as far as we can. So I look forward to your questions afterwards. Thank you.
great what fantastic case studies all of them um we're going to start to take some questions i don't know if everyone's got access to the chat could i have some thumbs up reactions or actual thumbs up to make sure we got we all do have access to the chat this is good um so there's a question uh from lucy for you cara um, are there any plans for any community gardens or allotments um, on the growing space or are you working with the young farmers and horticulturalists or, or will there be more community led growing on there with it's, uh, oh, yeah. and allotments? Sorry, that was one thing I chopped out to make my presentation shorter. Yeah, there, there was suggestion of community growing. It's it is it's not ideal. There's a really fast, busy road and a very narrow old bridge and a railway so it's very tricky to get access without making people get in cars but it's certainly on the table and if if there's a drive for it in the community then you know it's very possible and it could be you know it wouldn't have to be handed over to one landowner for management it you know it could be multiple parties at the moment everything is on the table and we we are keen to hear from from local people what they would like there. That's good to know. Maybe we can uh, assist with some of that car as well. Um, are there any other questions in the room at this point in time? Or shall we save them and um, and then move on to Lucy? To introduce the Community Land Advisory Service. Okay, thanks Anne Marie. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna share my screen. Bear with me. There he is. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, yeah, I'm um, just going to talk you through the Community Land Advisory Service, the support that we offer um, and what we're all about so that uh, you're... Um, is it? Can I click through one sec? OK, so um, if you don't know the Community Land Advisory Service, we have been around for 10 years now in Wales. Uh, and um, I've been on board since the very start. Um, and I, I left local government in uh, 2013. I worked for Newport Council for seven and a half years and um, on a total of 15 years in local government planning departments. Um, um, I'm a chartered town planner, so that's my background, having worked in the private sector and um, did manage the planning as well as helpline for a bit as well. So, um, yeah, I've got quite a varied background, um, but coming to um, social farms and gardens to manage the community land advisory service was, um, yeah, I suppose um, the ideal route for me because I always like working with um, communities. Um, and that, that, that did interest me and I came from a bit of a policy background um so yeah we uh, 13 um and then uh, when that five-year funding ran out Welsh Government Landscape Division were keen to to fund us um so we have ongoing funding from 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 them um and the funding is is to um increase uh increase access to land for community-led green space projects and enterprises so um i'd say you know a large part of that perhaps 85 percent is is around food growing type projects um but we do help um community-led projects around sort of community woodlands um wildflower meadows um and you know different, different we supported um, a group to sort of take on a on a park, for instance, as well. So there are those those elements. It is largely around 
community growing spaces, um, community gardens, community allotments, um, community supported agriculture, like the one in, in Swansea that was on the film. Um, but I think my message here today is is to um, just say that we are here for landowners, uh, um, particularly public landowners, as well as for the community projects. Um, you know, some, the support that we offer is is highly beneficial to you as public landowners. Um, to start off with, if um, we're wanting to su support. There are various things that we make sure that they're they're up to speed on before they start approaching local authorities and asking if they can have a bit of their land, for instance. So um, we make sure that they're representative of their community and they're not just one or two people um, and that they've set up in the right way of growing space, um, perhaps on a bit of incidental uh, the highway or how we and then perhaps just a um a constituted group would be okay but others you know like perhaps the csa we need to make sure that their governance um and is all set up and 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 it's sort of uh, ready to go um we get them to make sure that they're aware of what else is going on in their um in their local area um and whether they need or whether um you know that they're aware of the things that go going on and they're not repeating something that's already been done um and we make sure that they've got a clear vision and they know what um you know the the, the proposed outcomes are what they're hoping to achieve it needs to be concise and um you know they need to be ready to communicate that um and at the same time, we always advise that they speak to the local councillors in their area. Um, as we know, sometimes councillors like to be the first thing, first people to know about these things. Um, they don't want to hear hear about it sort of late on um, and not be, not be part of the conversation and ownership of the scheme, you know. So um, speak to local councillors, speak to the relevant departments in the local authority. Um, and um, as point nine sort of um, says here it, that, you know, if you need structures, if structures are essential, then we provide planning advice as to what is likely to gain planning permission, what needs planning permission um, right from the start, really, so that they're not perhaps um, entering into a land agreement on a site that's never going to get planning permission for any structures, for instance. Um, and of course, we get them to speak to the right people in the local authority, be that um, the estates team or the relevant portfolio hold holders, um, highways, housing, parks, um, education, etc. And, and then um, obviously speaking to funders quite early on, so it, just in case they've got any um, particular things uh, that they want commitment from, such as a term, you know, a lease term, or if they're happy for a, a short term license arrangement. Um, and um, yeah, as, as I've touched on with planning advice, um, we have got uh, a number of resources um, online. So as well as offering sort of one to one support, um, we uh, right across Wales, I should say as well. Um, we 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 do um, resources around um, sort of finding lands and the things that you should uh, you should do um, if you're on search for land. Um, we've got a template for heads of terms, all the important you know principle headlines that that people. Um, groups need to think about um, before entering into a lease and trying to get the landowners to perhaps agree um, <clears throat> to the heads of terms that they're suggesting. Um, and if there are some really important heads of terms or the terms or principles that perhaps a funder wants, you know, what well, we want a 10 year term. And the local authority, for instance, is saying, well, we only want to give it to you for two years, you know, early on. 
that it's perhaps time to walk away and find another site rather than getting into the the details of and legal ramifications and procedures um, before you realise that it's, it's, it's not a goer. Um, so um, we have, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I know you like your, your own sort of uh, documents and um, templates, but uh, yeah, we do have a terms document that, that's kept up to date with the latest advice from the likes of um, the RICS, for instance. Um, <clears throat> and um, we've also got um, in-house examples of leases and licenses from public private landowners. There is a template, um, a sort of an example license online that we did with the um, law school at Cardiff University. Um, we don't provide leases, um, example leases online because they can be applied um, to things that aren't appropriate. So we always make sure that we've got the details of project and the heads of terms completed before we even start talking about looking at examples of leases that might suit. Um, to up to date pieces of a um, resource as well are what needs planning permission and, and how to go about gaining planning permission. So these are all documents that perhaps you could um, community groups in the direction of, you could tell them to come to us if you're not sure that they're um, geared up quite correctly um, and we can do some sort of scoping and, and um, <clears throat> work with them to make sure that they are geared up correctly um, and um, they're getting the right sort of front advice really um, so that you know is a resource for guys um, as public landowners um, who may not have the, the time because um, we know your time is precious, that you you can and we'll we'll help out and work in partnership with you um, to get things um, in the right direction. Um, this is um, just a, a bit of a print screen, really, of um, one of our resources on how to go about finding land, and it's, it's you know as an example of um, you know the things that we. We suggest that the, that the community groups are thinking about right from the off. Um, and we've got a form that's sort of about introducing a community led project, which is based on perhaps some of the um, expression of interest type forms from local authorities and ask them about a bit of land. So we get those answers sort of um, ticked really. Um, in that introducing your community led project form so, be, so they can present their idea to the landowner in the right way. Um, so getting them thinking in the right direction all the time, really, which should be really helpful to you guys. And um, if, it, if it's not, or there's something more we could be doing or less, please, you know, we're always interested in, in hearing um, about about that, um, it can only be helpful, really. Um, <clears throat> this is um, an open screen of our sort of heads of terms and the things that you know we lay out really clearly. You know, site four, for instance, which is really important, and um, if they're in a position to pay any rent, what length of lease they want, those sorts of really important questions early on um, so a bit of a summary really um, we uh, we do get groups groups community projects um, in the right position before they they go to the public sector um, we've got sort of heads of terms and lots of templates and case studies and examples um, <clears throat> and resources um, that uh, are really useful really um, now while we talk about case studies I need to mention our annual awards every year we award 15 projects um, for being able to get on land and starting their projects up um, and it's a bit of a showcase really of all the amazing projects that are there um, and we we shine a light on 15 of them through um, short films that we get them to make and they create, they they also in partnership with an um a, a, a field worker or an officer from social farms and gardens they they um complete a resilience plan with 
shows how they are in compliance with the Wellbeing of Future Generation Act goals. That again, if you have one of those projects in your area, is specifically aimed at public bodies and the goals they've got to meet, and how community projects are helping them meet those goals. Um, and sometimes going even further than that, they you know they're doing the job for them. So you know, those resilience plans are something that we want to make more useful um, and more seen, um, more public. We have got a, a whole load of um, resilience plans over the last three years. Um, and if you're interested in seeing them, um, happy to share. Um, we are, yeah, we're struggling to sort of make them um, as, as public as we'd like and as useful as we like. So we've got a meeting with um, somebody from the Future Generation Commissioner's, um, Commissioner's Office um, How we can perhaps animate those resilience plans to make them um, a little bit more sort of readable and interesting and useful to public bodies and and the community groups and funders perhaps as well. Um, and um, yeah, if you speak to me very nicely, uh, I might be able to sort of provide you with um, uh, a copy of uh, or a PDF a version of our community growing resource pack if it's something that you're particularly interested in in terms of finding out all the different types of projects that are out there um, you know from the likes of incredible edible schemes on public land um, that sort of community farms and um, you know this resource pack is it's a little bit old but it's um it's really relevant in terms of providing information around the, all the different types of growing and how to go about starting up different projects and um and um, projects are trying to achieve uh these are our contact details um Trent is here today as well um answer them. Thank you very much. I'll then share my screen. Thanks, Lucy. That's great. Kim, over to you. OK. Thanks, Alison. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk uh, briefly a little bit more about something that we've been doing as part of the Resilient Green Spaces project, uh, which is we're calling uh, the Local Authority Learning Partnership, which kind of came out of the need for it came out of a, a, an event a little bit similar to this that we ran sort of this time last year. Um, uh, based on our work stream of, of supporting uh, the setup of sort of community farms on on public land. And something that really came out of it from some of the councillors and local authority officers who were there was the need to kind of have a bit of an, an open space that they could just sort of discuss some of the challenges they were facing in terms of supporting communities um, to access their land. So we uh, shared assets and the Land Workers Alliance, uh, who are both working on this work stream together, have been since September uh, 2022. We've been facilitating monthly meetings um, of the of this learning partnership where basically local authority or town council, community council uh, or councillors themselves, uh, any representative sort of public land holding bodies can come along and just have a have a bit of a chat, sometimes a bit of an event, but also to to share kind of good practice or like things that have worked well for them um, and got them over some hurdles and things like that. And sometimes we've had speakers come along um, or like a particular theme for the day. So we've talked about things from planning to procurement to um, working with schools and, and the community and things like that. Um, so we've, we've tried to create an environment which is quite um, sort of led by the people who are there and what they need to or want to speak about on that day. Um, and yeah, quite often, even if it's only a small group, it ends up being quite an interesting and, and sometimes quite inspiring discussion. And I think people generally leave with a sense of, uh, OK, I might be facing this problem today, but like other people have worked their way around it and, and maybe I can too. Um, and yeah, so we've, we've actually written a bit of a blog about um, some of the things we've learned from the process, which if it's not already on the Social Farms and Growing website, will be very soon. 
um, and the and the we've got just a couple of meetings left. Um, and also, if anybody here is is interested in joining the, in in with those, please email me. I'll put my email in the chat um, and make sure you get the invite. But our focus for the last couple of meetings is going to be kind of to produce a short document which shares some of the the good practice and the things that we've learned from each other in those meetings. Um, and also to make maybe a few sort of um, asks of, of policy or or otherwise for what would sort of help uh, other public landowners really move this work forward, like what the gaps are and what's missing at the minute in terms of support. So yeah, that's been that's been a really interesting um, thing that we've been running for the last few months, and I hope it will be able to continue in, in some way, maybe informally after the, the Resilient Green Spaces project, because I think the, the relationships that have been built, you know, amongst local authority staff um, have been really useful. And just to say also that we've, it's not always been people from the same sort of departments, you know, we've got a lot of sort of sustainable food people, but we've also had people from estates and we've had uh, councillors and things like that. So that sort of cross uh, department working has been really key to the success of it. And I'd say, you know, I would encourage anybody, even within a, a council or a local authority to think about ways you might be able to bring together your own different staff from different departments, just to have a bit of a chat because quite often because land sits across lots of different people's work and portfolios, it can be difficult for one department or one person to have all the information they need to help communities. So um, yeah, it can just be really useful to have a have a bit of a, an informal space to, to talk to each other and, and work out what some of the barriers you're all facing are and how you can help each other out. Um, that's basically what I wanted to say on that. But just before I finish, I want to uh, share another link uh, that some of you might find useful, which is related to the so the French film that we saw earlier on. Um, they, I know of them through a, an organization called the Access to Land Network, which works across Europe on access to land issues for communities. Um, and we've just helped them produce this sort of online guide, which I'm just going to try and pop the link for in the chat, um, which is called Local Authorities Making Farmland Work for the Public Good. And it kind of has, has lots of case studies and tips and resources, but it goes through sort of the different roles that local authorities can play. Um, so either as a landowner or as um, a facilitator of, of land access or also as a regulator of land access. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's quite a sort of straightforward guide and you can you know dip in and out of it. Um, so I just thought I would share that as well in case that's that's useful. And yeah, there's examples from all over Europe, including, I think, the, the French uh, locality that we saw earlier so yeah just encourage you to take a look at that as well but that's me thanks very much that's brilliant thanks so much kim um just wanted a final kind of section on here so we've, we've looked at some hopefully quite inspiring case studies to give you ideas of what could be done with land and and how that can be approached and then a couple of um options there for kind of making that happen through the learning partnerships and the clouds, those advice places that you can go to for that initial bit of support. Um, and we just wanted to spend a few minutes just looking at some of the policy areas that are out there um, or the specific policies that are out there that can be used as kind of a lever or a driver for change. Um, and um, I think as, as Lucy and Kim have both mentioned, obviously land does sit across many um, portfolios and has many priorities on it, much as the local authorities themselves and the public bodies themselves have many different priorities. So does that land um, and some really interesting work going on around land and land use frameworks um, at the moment. But just going to pick out on a couple of bits. So Holly, I don't know if you're there and able to kick off first. I can't see you at the moment. Um, Holly's the lovely um, policy coordinator, Wales policy coordinator for Landmark Alliance. Just to say, I know there are some non-Wales people here. We will be focusing on Wales policy, but it's always worth thinking of them, you know, might be similar policies or there's a reason why they're happening in Wales and they might be happening in Scotland, Northern Ireland and England as well. And some of them obviously cover the whole of the UK. Um, so still hopefully relevant and useful. Thanks, Holly. Hi, uh, yeah, um, I'm just uh, figuring out how to share my screen as Teams seems to have completely changed since I was last on it. Um, so. We can share, we will share all the slides afterwards. So um, if anything can't be shared now, we can ping them around after. Yeah, I mean, maybe, um, maybe for the sake of time, I will just, um, if I can get it in one minute, I'll 
I'll do it. Okay, yeah, I think that's, I think I've got it. Can people see that? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Holly. I'm the Welsh Policy Lead for Landworkers Alliance. Um, and I've been working with Kim on the community farms aspect of resilient green spaces. Um, I'm just here just going to talk through a few things where I think the Welsh policy support or um, or even where it doesn't um, making land available for communities. Um, so first of all, I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the Environment Act as they do place obligations on public bodies, including local authorities. Um, but and these are sort of very overarching, but there are ways in which facilitating this land could support local authorities in meeting their obligations. Um, so, for example, the fact one of the obligations under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is the goal of more cohesive communities. Also, there's healthier communities, uh, um, also healthier Wales and more resilient Wales, and having in, in as you've seen from some of the case studies, having more people coming onto the land, learning, building that those connections and being able to access food and spend time outdoors um, can help support those goals. And there's also the duty on um, well on public bodies to enhance biodiversity, to maintain and enhance it in and to have that consideration throughout their decision making. So the if if a community were interested in taking over a piece of land and their plans for a farm or a community garden um, was using particular farming that in, enhanced biodiversity, as many of them will be, um, because they tend to be focused on more diverse um, sort of small scale gardens and such like, then that can be then including uh, that can help again help the local authority meet those obligations. Um, so in terms of how the communities can access land, um, there's various different types of tenure that could be used. So um, as Lucy mentioned, there's licenses, leases, or the transfer of a freehold, and the there for for transferring either long term lease or freehold conditions on local authorities, and they they're firstly governed by a UK wide legislation, the Local Government Act, nineteen seventy two. This is what first enabled them to sell off land, but it initially had the requirement that they have to sell to the highest bidder. Uh, that's no longer the case um, under the general disposal of consent Wales um, rules that they local authorities can take a decision to not sell to the highest bidder if they are confident that a particular organ, you know, a particular sale would lead to an enhancement of environmental, social or economic benefits for that their community. Um, and so if um, you know, we don't like to see public assets sold off, but if a if a local authority is looking to do that, then it's not you, know, you don't have to go for the highest bidder who wants to do something that you know, may not be a benefit. You can look at how this would benefit the local community by um, passing it on to a group who have um, got a, a got got goals to enhance these benefits. Um, there's been some guidance produced by Stado Camry, um, both in terms of guidance for applicants and also recommended processes. So most local authorities will have an existing process for community asset transfers. Um, when I looked, it was they they are all quite different and some are more well publicized than others. Um, so if your local, you know, if you are looking at developing it, do 
do have a look at the guidance. Um, and then there's a few policies that are coming down the line that aren't directly related to local authorities, but may have some relevance. Um, at the, the moment, Welsh Government is giving out grants for various rural payments, um, including horticulture startup grants. So this might be relevant to a local group that wanted to start up a market garden. And there's grants available for around £3,000 um, for a startup. That's open at the moment. It's a fairly short window, but um, it seems it was open last year. It seems like it will be an ongoing one. There's also things like forestry grants and um, horticulture development grants for existing market gardens. So it, um, and those would be to help the people who are doing doing that work um, themselves. So that could be supporting the community group. Um, Welsh Government have also made a commitment to develop a community food strategy, and they're currently consulting on that. Um, with Miller Research. The exact what they mean by a community st food strategy is still very, um, seems very up in the air, but it will no doubt have some relevance to local authorities and um, we hope it will also have a, an element with supporting land access. Um, there's also a bill going through the Senate, which is um, the Food Wales Bill. Um, and although this is, it's very unclear whether this will actually pass, um, it's just important to note it because it does include requirements on local authorities to develop local food plans. So that could in again include how your own land could be used for um, growing food or having um, raising and how that could be used with in, in collaboration with local community groups and local farmers. And then there's, of course, the new agricultural policy under the sustainable farming scheme. And this will have, uh, although, again, this is still in consultation, so it's not completely clear what will be in, what will the final one will look like. Um, there is support at the mo the latest proposals include providing support for facilitating public access to the countryside, um, farms hosting educational visits and care farms, setting up new horticultural enterprises, and also so, so that would be those kind of supports would be for an individual farm, but for collaboration. So they've also got a stream of the work. Where they, they want different actors to collaborate and that would and that could include local authorities um so they want a particular um this will include things like uh, collaboration across a bioregion um but it could also include collaborating for providing land access so whether that's things like footpaths or um farm visits and collaboration across the supply chain. So that could be looking at how working with retailers, markets and farms and the local authority, you can ac facilitate um, more local supply chains in your area. And um, that's all I've got for now. Um, if there, I don't know if there's any questions, so I'll pass over back to you, Alison. Yeah, I've just got a couple of oh, sorry, a couple of bits just pick up on that. Sorry, I'm feedbacking a little bit there. I just wanted to add in a couple of other things just worth noting at the moment. Uh, oh, hang on, sorry, I've lost it. Here we go. Um, so something going through the House of Lords at the moment as an amendment to the Leveling Up and Regeneration Bill, which does affect England, is the um, the Right to Grow campaign, which is being led by Pam Warhurst of Incredible Edible. Um, and I just wanted to raise this, even though this is a, a, a Wales uh, forum, um, because it's one of the things in there is a requirement on local authorities to maintain a list of land suitable for cult community cult cultivation. and um, while that's kind of quite a bullish approach, I suppose, to um, encouraging local authorities to maintain that list of um, 
spaces that can be uh, used for commun communities can access and use. Um, it, I guess it's just kind of a, a coming up, maybe coming out of frustration that it's not always that easy for communities to access that land. Um, so uh, some of the work that we've been doing in Wales through CLAS in particular has been on building those relationships up and so facilitating spaces between communities and um, local authorities and other public bodies um, and using those things, spaces like those learning partnerships um, and the CLAS uh, function in order to encourage um, the sharing of good practice uh, rather than kind of using maybe the legislative uh, route um, and in encouraging that instead. But I think it's just worth noting that that's going on across the border and some of those, um, the reasoning behind that and some of this, the stuff coming out of that could also affect local authorities in Wales going forward. Um, so one of the ways as well that we're looking to help support local authorities and other public bodies who don't have much capacity, as we know, is by sharing data. So this is um, a map that we've been developing uh, previously through social farms and gardens and now more recently as part of the Resilient Green Spaces project on Land Explorer, which is an open source technology. Um, and we've mapped on here uh, community gardens. Here they're all the same. You can just see the numbers of them. Um, but if you if you drill down, you can see the different types of uh, organisations. There's allotments, community orchards, uh, incredible edible projects, CSAs um, operating in Wales. Um, and at the moment, this is pin data, but we have also got the capacity to put spatial data on here. And then also this can be downloaded and exported. So what we're really keen to do is to keep building on this um, kind of bank of data and be able to, and we, we're very open to sharing it with anyone. So we can share it in a GeoJSON link or as a shape file, and then that can be overlaid with any of the data that you've got within your public body, um, such as health data or data on your land ownership. And it can start to build that bigger picture of the green infrastructure and the community engagement in that space. Um, so it's a really exciting um, function that's there. And then just building on a couple of the things that Holly mentioned um, with a couple of links, really. So as Holly said, the community food strategy, which sits within the Food and Drink Wales, is undergoing Miller research at the moment, uh, undergoing research and testing at the moment uh, during this month and next month. So have a little look at that link on there if you want to get involved. Um, it's a woman called Jessica at Miller Research, and they're looking for people to feed back on that at, at the moment. And then also a great example of community asset transfer where there's been a simplified process for gardening and growing. So rather than having to go through the full asset transfer, um, Lucy's been working with the team at RCT um, just to simplify it, a much easier process just for gardening because there isn't the, the kind of same planning obligations as there is on, um, on buildings. Uh, so yeah, that was just a couple of things. And as Gary said there, um, we will be able to share all the slides afterwards and we'll pop the whole recording up online as well so that the whole thing can be seen in all the individual videos. And um, the other thing I just wanted to mention within the kind of policy area just quickly is um, it's great to see so many sustainable food place officers here today. Um, and um, I think that's just a really useful model, a really useful framework to use your network across Wales and across the UK. And lots of you sit within public sectors, lots of you don't. Um, so it's a great opportunity to share though your experiences um, with, and I know there's, that you have lots of meet, meetings, uh, meetups, and also um, to kind of look at the different drivers that you're using in your area, what's kind of really pushing and what's working there um, in order to open up more land for, uh, for community growing or for new entrant access. Um, so that's me, I'll shut up now. Anne-Marie, back to you if anyone else wants to talk. <laughs> Well, that was a nice segue, actually, Alison. Thanks very much. Um, so we've heard a lot from everyone here. And as Alison says, it's great to see so many sustainable food places, peoples here and sustainability officers. Um, you've heard a lot from us. There's a lot of inspiration. I, for one, went, oh, my God, well, no, that's that seems so sensible to have um, the canteen staff at schools leading um, cooking lessons. And fits so perfectly with the new Welsh curriculum. That just seems like a bit of a no-brainer to me. How fantastic! Um, but I, you know, th th they're some of the ones that we've picked up on. But I'm aware that there's probably 
if not questions, some thoughts, responses, other inspirational work that you're doing that you'd like to tell us about? Who would like to unmute and speak to the rest of the room? Somebody's got something exciting to say. I was wondering whether I could put Augusta on the spot if she's there, because they've just put an exciting. Um, so we have the great fun of SPF and SFP. So the sustainable food places supporting with a shared prosperity fund um, bid in Carmarthenshire around kind of a food system approach. And I know obviously it's still at bid stage, but that's been quite an interesting process. Um, kind of wherever it gets to really. It's lovely and sunny in Carmarthenshire by the lips of things today. Yes, um, um, hi everybody. Um, I just had to take myself out onto the front doorstep because it's so lovely. I thought I need some of those rays as well. Um, so yes, um, I'm not, I mean, you know, um, as Alison said, we've just um, submitted a um, shared prosperity fund bid in Carmarthenshire um, based on sort of talking a lot to our grassroots Carmarthenshire Food Network um, over the last year or so and um, them kind of co-producing that plan with us um, taking that back to our strategic group and um, Boyd Cigar Food um, and trying to synthesise that into a, a shape that um, we can take forward. Um, we have really strong engagement um, and support from Carmarthen County Council on our um, steering group and um, we are looking to um, take forward a plan um, involving a community asset if that's successful um, to um, look at um, a, a model of um, uh, public land to public plate. So building on, um, hopefully building on the work um, that uh, we've been doing with the um, um, uh, sustainable food um, hubs through the um, resilient, as part of the resilient green spaces um, wider um, program of work. So um, that was looking at um, getting, uh, aggregating produce from 10 small scale growers in Carmarthenshire um, through, via a food hub um, in Llanelli to um, various um, local authority and um, now a health board setting as well um, to just at a very small scale to trial the concept and build relationships with our procurement managers here in Carmarthenshire um, and uh, to lay that groundwork really to build on so um, we're hoping to be able to take that into the next phase um, fingers crossed if we are successful if not we will be going right back to the drawing board and, and see what can uh, can come about anyway thank you Any other thoughts, comments from people on what they've seen this morning? New inspirations, something you've done already that you would like to share and help inspire others? Uh, I just a little addition, just a, just a comment really that the the film based in France, yeah, probably like for everybody, was really fantastic to see. It does seem such common sense. And it's, it's been great to work a little bit with Augusta and the plans they've got there. I was just curious with the other sustainable food officers, uh, is there anything similar happening in your in your regions? You know, like that starting to grow public food on public land. What's happening elsewhere? Anyone doing anything like that? Well, Elaine has her hand raised, so maybe Elaine has a has a response to that. Hello, Hi. Um, we have oh, well, two projects. I was going to speak of one, but you know, sort of capturing the question on that one. Um, we're actually looking at procurement within the county. So we have um, we had a baseline sort of project, a pilot project to see if one of our farmers could procure, could grow enough of one vegetable to be able to get into the system and be able to procure for Monmouthshire. <clears throat> so um, that was um, that was positive and there were some learning points from it. Um, equally, you know, so like the procurement system we are finding challenging <laughs> um, and getting our local producers into that system. So we're working with Castle Howell at the moment as the middleman so that if we can get our producers up to the standards that Castle Howell will accept them as a producer, then hopefully the procurement can be sourced from or through Castle Howell. 
Um, so that's what we're doing in Monmouthshire. But one of our um, projects that we're really pleased with, which is taking off, it's still in its baby steps, but it's allocating, it's partnering a farmer with a school. And the farmer is taking a year group through the seasons on the farm. And the schools are really engaging with it and it's getting some really lovely positive feedback. And we've got uh, about 10 schools partnered with 10 farmers at the moment. Um, so it's just starting, still very new, so haven't got a lot to report back on it. But there is a, a take up, which is always good with a new project. <laughs> uh, it's not been an easy one engaging the farmers, um, but the schools have really been positive. So that's what we're up to. There's a, great, uh, there's a great opportunity for schools, isn't there, with, particularly with the with the new curriculum in, in Wales and well, yeah, not so new now for primary schools, but coming in for, for, for secondaries as well. Um, yeah, well, yeah. We're, we're targeting with cooking skills as well. Mm. So what they're growing with their farmers, they'll then be cooking and then hopefully composting and growing on site mm. at the school as well to also help with the cost of living and getting fresh vegetables locally to families. Um, and trying to educate them about growing themselves. And 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 long may that disperse out further as well. Um, sorry, Cara, did I interrupt? Were you, were you, were you coming back on that? I only just wanted to hear a little bit more. Actually, what, what activities do the schools do with the farmer? So at the moment, there's only a couple of links in with the curriculum, but I know some have got targets about, you know, seasonality, locality. So they're linking in with geography. Some will be looking at soil. Some will be looking at the science side of it. Um, things with the dairy farmers and of the likes, they're going to be encouraging, you know, sort of all of the maths and the English coming through so they'll be working out one of the farmers because it's been so cold and wet hasn't been able to get the cows out into the fields so she's given the children how much is it going to cost me you know if this feed is x amount and each cow eats x amount of weight how much feed do i need to buy and how much will it cost me now in two weeks so they're actually using live experiences and they're feeding back things like um you know, sort of just the new lambs, you know, so rather than at Easter, they'd talk about lambs. They're now actually going to be talking about the fleece, the feed, how they care for those animals. And the idea as well is to inspire careers and, you know, sort of hopefully the growers, producers, farmers of the future. Lovely. That's brilliant. And, and, and the farmer's getting some free accountancy. Brilliant. Um, Holly and then Jack. Yeah, I love that example, <laughs> giving the math things to the kids. Um, yeah, I was going to follow up on what Elaine was saying about the procurement project um, with a different hat on as um, co-founder of Blast Gwent, which is a, a veg farm between Cardiff and Newport. We did a pilot with Castle Howell last year on supplying courgettes into the Cardiff schools and um, I can there's a case study report about that so I can post it in the link and then this working ex, this pilot's being expanded to now include Monmouthshire um, and our experience from the farmer side was that it it would it worked really well um, Castle Howell were great to work with and we're really excited that this is being expanded to now include other farms um, there's also involved in um, and um, so, yeah, it'll be exciting to see what happens in this expanded version of the project. But it's also, as um, someone mentioned, relating to the uh, change in the curriculum and, well, um, and the free school meals um, that Welsh Government policy to have free school meals for primary kids. Don't know how to put my hand down. <laughs> I get that. That Teams is doing something quite exciting at the minute where you put your hand up, it notices that you've spoken and it will automatically take it down. So you don't have to take it down yourself. Um, but I'm quite excited about that. Um, Jack. Hi, yeah, uh, I thought I'd introduce myself. Um, I'm the local food coordinator in Swansea Council. 
Um, we've just recently finished a feasibility study uh, into mapping local produce to shorten food supply chains. Um, I have got a final version. I was just seeing if I could share it on the chat, but we're just currently waiting for it to be uploaded to our main website, which would probably be um, a better place. If you give me a couple of days, maybe Amory, I'll um, I'll forward it to you, and then you can um, you can share from your end. So that that's predominantly based. Um, my role actually sits within economic development, so we're we're focusing on shortening food supply chains within and predominantly food business. There's some crossover with community. Um, you know, for instance, CSAs will have an economic output. Um, so we do have a, a small hold on that, but not it's not going to be the bulk of our work. But this has been interesting because, um, you know, uh, allotments are, are on our um, our framework. Um, business allotments is or or, or <clears throat> open up land for. Um, we've had cafes and restaurants inquire now because the veg bills have have gone through the roof and they're, they're thinking, you know, it's, it might be cheaper to put a, a grower and a um, uh, and renting a plot of land and having that sort of turnover of, you know, get, getting staff one day a week to to work that land. So we're looking at things like that. Um, and yeah, that's well, yeah, there's going to be um, and I'm currently building my my role's just been uh, extended for another two years, so I'm currently building my um, future schedule of works as as we speak. And a lot of the mapping study which we've created is feeding into um, what I think I should be doing, which I'll have to get signed off. Um, yeah, so I just thought I'd mention that I'd get that shared. I also run briefly mentioned because I'm in council hours, but I also run a project called Farmco in Swansea, which started off as a food hub. Um, through the food assembly actually six years ago but um is now taking more shape as a online farm shop i would say we do have a collection point um producers still upload their their, their produce and and sell through our means but we we have a home delivery service and a one day a week farm shop at the moment where the producers fill the shelves and we um man the shop um so then that i can share a link if if anyone's interested in that on on the chat here if you want to find out more great thanks jack <clears throat> can test out that team's function by not lowering your hand yourself um <laughs> are there any other comments or questions from anybody i'm conscious of time um and i know kim's going to do a summary does anyone have anything burning they'd like to say or chat, uh, share? I think that's an over to you, Kim. Thanks, Emery. Um, yeah, I'm just going to close us briefly. But um, if just to say before I do that, if anyone did have maybe a particular question for one of the, the speakers today or something that they wanted to just stay on for briefly, that's that's no problem. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, thank you all for coming. Thank you to all the speakers um, and formal and the ones who have just contributed. It's really great to hear all, all sorts of things that are going on all over the place. And I hope it's been, um, yeah, sparked some ideas for people about how they might do things differently on their land. And I guess just to say that, uh, yeah, in particular, the, you know, the Resilient Green Spaces project is still going on for a couple more months and you can get in touch with, with the Social Farms and Gardens team or the LWA or Shared Assets um if if you need our, our help with things so yeah just um get in touch keep up the good work i'm sure you're already doing and if we can help you kind of take things further just just let us know but yeah thanks so much everyone and hope you have a good rest of your day bye for now thank See you, you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. i'm, I'm going to stop the recording but if you'd like to stay on and have a chat please do